As Lisa mentioned 13 years ago, on this first Sunday in August, we got together in what was our office, actually, for our very first church service. We had 60 people, and it was jammed to the gills or rafters, however you want to say it. We were right on 2nd and Pennsylvania Southeast. So we could see the Supreme Court, the back of the Supreme Court building out of one of our windows. There was a real sense of holy purpose that was there. And there was a sense of being very hot because the air conditioners didn't work. And that's our first service. And then to see all of you and this the uh, first service today as well. We had an incredible service to see you, the church, come together uh, on this day in 2015, first Sunday of August is a great blessing. I'm going to be a little bit reminiscent with you. Uh, and again, I, I see some faces that were here in the early days as well. But uh, to, when we talk about 30 years of ministry, I mean, it's shocking to me that I can say that I've done anything for 30 years, in all honesty. Uh, I know, however, that I, I have been encouraged by people that they're looking forward to the next 30. And I have a great-grandfather that lived to the age of 102. And he preached till he was 100. So I'm going to be up here. Just get ready for it. You know, Lisa's going to be wheeling me up or whatever is needed. Uh, he also outlived three wives. I won't do that part. I, I married a younger woman, uh, five years younger than me. So I, I was ready for that one. She's going to be with me till the end. So, um, But I was thinking those 30 years. And it was such a, a wonderful evening last night. Uh, so wonderful in the sense that our faith family was around us. We were hearing stories that people were sharing. I always wanted to be a part of a church like this. Always. Now, that sound, might sound funny because being the lead pastor, you know, it sounds like, well, of course you love your church, and I do. But I always wanted to attend a church like this as well. A church where people genuinely care about each other and love being together. So it was great to be together last night, and then my oldest half-brother, Jack, showed up with his wife, Nardos. That's the third time I've been able to be with him in my life, and it was the most meaningful time of conversation that I've had with him, and it meant so much to me that he would come from New Hampshire, that they would both come and be seated there with us to be a part of that 30th uh, celebration. I just felt like my dad, who died at the age of 44 when I was six months old, I just felt like my dad was there. And it was such a meaningful sense of having family, having my wife, who has been there throughout the entire, almost the entirety of my time in ministry. And for every year of their lives, that's been years that they've been right here in the ministry as well, meaning my daughter's. And, uh, and it's significant. There are moments in life you'll never forget. And I know that this 30th anniversary is one of those moments. And to give you a little bit of a background, I remember with my brother going to the library, and I was going to pick out a college for my brother, who's two years older. And we got a hold of those books that tell about all the different universities. And I wanted my brother Todd to be able to go to a good Christian university. So I looked up Oral Roberts University, because we would watch Oral Roberts preach on Sunday morning television. And I said, I know they have a university. They're always showing a prayer tower, and they've got a university there. And my brother wanted to be a medical doctor, and I wanted to be a lawyer. So that was a, neither one happened, and that, that was a university that had a medical school and a school of law. And so we, uh, my brother went two years earlier than I did, and I came and joined him, and we were roommates. Uh, For at least my first year there, we were roommates together. Now, in my freshman year, a man by the name of Dr. Jerry Horner, who ended up being the dean of the seminary at ORU, was sponsoring our brother-sister floor, uh, brother-sister wing um, retreat. And he delivered a message that night. I went back to my cabin where I was with the other guys, and I fell on my knees. The Spirit of God was so strong there, and I knew I was being called to full-time ministry. I knew it. And I was just praying, and others were coming around me to lay their hands on me and pray for me. I knew that calling was there. That calling actually came 34 to 35 years ago, uh, 30 years of ministry now, but 
It was in my freshman year, so 34 years, I guess, ago, I was called to the ministry. Well, immediately what I did is I began to cast seed in the direction of the inklings of the Holy Spirit, the leadings of the Holy Spirit in my life. I felt called to the ministry, so I began to get involved in things on campus. One of those things was the community outreach program, which is a way to get all those university students into community service and ministering even while they're students. And I got on staff, and the director of that program is a person that some of you may know, and he's a good friend, and that's Ron Luce, who started uh, Teen Mania Ministries. Now, Ron and I were very good friends, and Ron and I would talk about someday the things we wanted to do for God. And he knew that there was a calling on my life. I knew there was a calling on his life as well. And so one night in one of our staff meetings there in uh, the chapel on the campus of ORU, he said to the staff, get ready, we're heading out, uh, we're going to do ministry tonight as our staff meeting. I thought, oh, that's, that's cool. And he says, Bill, you're preaching, get ready, you'll be preaching in a matter of about five minutes. I said, to whom? I've never preached in my life. It's my first sermon. He said, you'll know when we get there. Just get ready, but get ready. The attention span may not be great, so just keep it short, but you're preaching. And then he said, I brought my guitar, and he gave that to another member of the student staff, and you're, you're leading worship. So he was trying to, to challenge us to get out of you know, our comfort zone. We arrive at a nursing home, and we go into the nursing home, and I get up there, to speak, and uh, to this day, I don't remember what I said, but I had, I had formed a, a mini message. I got up there, and I don't mean to sound disrespectful in any way, but I'm going to tell you exactly what happened, because it's the reality of my first sermon. One of the ladies got up out of her chair, of the ones that were seated there listening, got up out of her chair and began to walk and pace in front of me as I'm preaching. I've never seen anything like this before. And as she's pacing back and forth, she begins to, began to cuss like a sailor. I mean, as loud as can be. And then all of a sudden, she, you think that Janet Jackson had a wardrobe malfunction a few years ago? She had a wardrobe malfunction. It just went down. Now, I'm preaching my first sermon, and she's dropping F-bombs and walking back and forth like this. And now I can see the limited attention span. Nobody's listening to me anymore. <laughs> Nobody was saved. That was my first, that was my first sermon. That was my first sermon. And, and so then I remember my senior practicum. I went to work with the Billy Graham uh, team and Billy Graham was a very good friend of my dad's. My dad was second only to Billy Graham in the size of his meetings. And those things. And Cliff Barrows, who was Billy Graham's song leader, was my dad's song leader first. So I reached out to uh, Cliff and ended up working there with my senior practicum. And I remember being able to walk around with, uh, with the team and to be able to just see what that was, was like at that time. And I remember that, and I shared this with the group last night at the celebration of 30 years that we had here in the building, I said, you know, I remember that Cliff Barrows had lunch with me and he said, he said, so Bill, tell me about this calling that you feel on your life to ministry. And I told him about the retreat that I had been on and, and how I just knew that God was calling me. And he said, well, Bill, if you can do anything else, do it. And I said, I said, well, what do you mean by that? He said, Bill, this is a calling. It's not simply a profession. And with that calling, there will be moments in which you'll be at a mountaintop experience and you'll feel everything's going well. There'll be moments in which you're in the valley and it will be difficult. And in those valley moments, you will have to tap that certainty of a call to be able to make it through. And then he did something I just, I, I, I honestly, I'd never had this done before. It was the last day of the crusade, and he put his arms around me, and I thought it was one of those, you know, you hug and let go moments. He, didn't let go. he did not let go. And he held me there, and he just began to pray over me. And as he prayed, I felt like I had my dad there. And he said after the prayer, he said, Bill, I want to give you advice. You're going to go back to ORU as a student here 
to finish out your time at ORU. And you're coming straight off of being with Billy Graham and with the team. And he said there could be a sense in which people will wonder if you're coming back to save ORU. Like everybody else is lost. I've been with Billy Graham. I'm coming to save you kind of a thing. He said, Bill, I want to encourage you. When you go back, go back in extreme humility. And when you go back in extreme humility, people will open the doors of their hearts and they will listen to what you've experienced. And you'll be able to minister deeply into their hearts. I went back and, and he said, this is the advice I believe your dad would give you at this moment. I went back to ORU. I gathered together as many people from the community of Tulsa that I could. I ended up getting the baseball stadium uh, at ORU, getting a team of people together, and we held a student crusade. And we saw a lot of people from Tulsa get saved. I was putting into action what I'd learned at the Graham uh, meetings. And then I thought nothing more of it. When I graduated, it was a difficult time for me. And I'll get into my sermon in just a moment. These are just a few thoughts before I jump in. It was a difficult time in that my brother and I had purchased our very first vehicle. And it was a dusty rose Cadillac that we paid $500 for. And I remember it was good, in good shape. No scrapes, no damage. But it's this massive vehicle. But it's what we could afford. And we could not afford the insurance on it for another 30 days till we made more money. Bad idea. I was driving that vehicle and I was making a left in the first month of owning it. My, my brother's in the vehicle with me. I'm driving the vehicle, making a left. I see that the oncoming traffic is also going to make a left when we have our moments to do it. And then the, I look down the lane in the lane next to it and it was, it was free to be able to make that left. Well, somebody was coming in the lane that was behind those turning left and going full speed and just shifted lanes at the last minute and clipped me good. That beautiful Cadillac was now damaged. And I remember we didn't have insurance. So I lost my license. And it's confession time here. I lost my license, and I remember my mom did not make that easy on me in that she called me from her apartment and said, Bill, the police are going back and forth down the street. I think they're looking for you. And she was serious. It's not like I killed anybody. I didn't rob a bank. In 30 days, I was going to pay the insurance, you know. So I go out on ministry. After graduating from ORU, I go directly out as a preacher on a music ministries team, and I, we went through the 10, uh, or 10 states in the southeast United States. And I was preaching. They were uh, the music team. And I was putting together a sermon every day, looking to God for fresh revelation. I had a stack of sermons after that that, that were helpful for years until I lost all of them in a hotel room. Another story. But, but, uh, but I, that summer, did not have a license. I knew that when I was coming back, I had some things I had to do pretty quick. When I, to get my life in order, when we got back off of that trip, the director of music ministries for ORU approached the van. I got out of the van. I'm exhausted. I've given every ounce of energy I have to preaching in all these places. I have no voice left. My energy level is like nothing. I step off the van and Steve Bean, good friend, came to me and he didn't say, how was your summer? Bill, good to see you. Immediately he said, Bill, did you hear about Ted? And Ted was one of my closest friends. I said, no, what? What about Ted? He said he died uh, just a few days ago in France, rock climbing. He fell and instantly killed. Now, this is the moment where I get off the van. He tells me this. My mom and my brother moved from... Tulsa, where I was coming back to while I was gone on my trip. They went out to California. How about having your family move away? You come back, don't have any place to stay. I didn't have a job. I didn't have a license. I felt like a convict. And I, how, how am I going to find a job without the ability to drive around and, and ask? And I had no place to stay and I had no money. So I remember at that moment getting on my knees and just praying to God and Steve, the director of music ministry, said, Bill, 
you come stay with my roommate and me uh, over at the graduate housing there that the university owned. And he said, we don't really have much of a place for you, but you can stay right there on my waterbed, which I did. I had never slept next to somebody night after night until I was able to get my own place that had a waterbed. I don't know if you remember waterbeds. I don't like them. <laughs> waterbeds, I mean, every time this uh, Steve would move, I would flop over onto the floor. And plus the water's always too cold. It just, you know, it, it's not a great thing. So I remember at that time thinking, God, please help me. And I remember that a letter came to me from my uh, roommate at ORU, the one that had been my roommate. His father sent me a letter, and I had met his father, and I admired his father. I called him the admiral. I just, I saw my roommate had a dad, and I wanted to see what a dad was like, because I hadn't experienced that. And I saw a great example in him. He sent me a letter, and it said, Bill, I understand you've been on hard times of late. And he said, when I was in the military, I think it was the Navy, if I remember correctly, he says, when I was in the military, I got on hard times, and there was somebody that invested $200 in me and said, I believe in you to take the next step. I believe God's in charge, and he'll take care of you. He said, Bill, I've passed that $200 along so many times in my life, and I'm putting it in this letter to you now. You're going to get on your feet. I believe in you. I'm praying for you. God's going to take care of you. I learned through the one that gave me his own room and let me stay right on his own waterbed, the one that sent the letter to me, my roommate and his father, I learned that there was a family of faith that was around me. I got a phone call. And with that phone call, it was the new chaplain at ORU. And he said, he said, Bill, you don't know me. My name is Ron McIntosh. But he said, I uh, was going through my office here. I'm brand new to the university, just starting as chaplain. A position I would later have at the university, but I didn't know it then. And he said, I'm the chaplain, the campus pastor here. And he said, I was looking through a, uh, a closet. I was clearing it out, and I saw a videotape. Remember the days of VHS? We used to think that was sharp resolution. It's not. And I mean, now it's so blurry. I'm thinking, how do we ever think it was sharp? But he put that VHS tape in that was marked Student Crusade. He didn't know what it was. And when he put it in, he saw me preaching, and he said, God spoke to me right at that moment. You're to hire him. He's to be the community outreach director. That was my first job that came out of ORU. And I think of so many people who had strategic moments in my life to believe in me in so many different ways. So I wanted to share a little bit about that uh, with you. I think to myself as I look at some of the people in the scriptures, what is it about them that God saw? What is it about their heart that caused God to pause as his eyes go to and fro throughout the whole earth? What causes God to stop on a certain individual and say, I'm going to use that person, even when they're unknown, even when nobody else is even aware that they're usable, that there be anything about their life that could be used by God? What causes God to stop and see a shepherd boy by the name of David? And there's David in the fields, and he's tending sheep. He's unknown. He's in the house of Jesse. What causes God to say to his greatest prophet of the day, Samuel, to say to that great prophet, you go to the house of Jesse. There's one there I want to anoint as the next king. What caused God's heart and his eyes to stop and say, that's the one? There's something of the quality of the heart of that young shepherd, and I'm going to use him. I'm going to raise him up to be the greatest king of Israel. Or we go into the New Testament. What is it about that girl that is likely a teenager at the moment that the angel visits her and tells her that she will bring forth the Messiah? What is it about Mary? What is it about the quality of her heart, her worship life, the hunger she had to please God? What is it about Mary? What is it about people like that? And I want to capture that somehow. I want that to be a part of who I am. I want that to be a part of who you are so that God's eyes will stop when it comes to your family and say you're the one to minister to your family or in regard to where you were, say you're the one. I've chosen you. I've seen your heart. I'm going to use you. And that is a quality that we see in the individual that I'm going to talk about today. And I learned that even though in the first service I thought I was going to do this entire sermon 
in the first service. I only got through a third of it. So this is a two-parter uh, that we have today, and I learned that early, early this morning. In Genesis 37, in the first five verses, we see these words. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel, and that's Jacob, uh, his name was changed to Israel, same person. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. I want to focus in for just a moment on that first verse because the reality is I could camp on this first verse for weeks. There's so much power inherent in it. And yet we pass by it so quickly. The Bible says in that 37th chapter, first verse of Genesis, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed. It's a reference point to Jacob as to his identity. Now think for a moment with me because Jacob, Jacob is this one that we see the battle between he and his brother for the birthright. We see him running for his very life. We, the, the story of Jacob being in the tent as he wrestles with God and as God changes his name over to Israel and all that we see that is going on in his life with Laban, his father-in-law, and how he's tricked into marrying uh, Leah when it was supposed to be Rachel, he thought that he was marrying, the one that he so deeply loved. He'll end up having both as his wives and he will end up also having these children that we read about and it's although we tend to think of success in terms of great exploits we look at Jacob and we have to recognize that Jacob never won a great battle he was not a military guy he was not a great military hero he won no great battles he never wrote a book of the Bible He never wrote any great books that we're aware of in any way. And so what we see in him him are not the things that we would normally think of in regard to success in some way. Instead, what we see in this story is the story of a family. And that begins to make it applicable this morning to you and me. Because every one of us came out of a family or were currently in a family that may surround us now. Maybe you're away from your family and you've come a distance and now you're in the D.C. area. And we see that Jacob goes to stay in, uh, to be in the land of Canaan where his father stayed. I remember that my mom wanted me to stay for a moment, to experience for a moment the land of my father. And what I mean by that is that my mom very strategically wanted me to be in my father's world. Though he died at the age of 44, though I didn't know him and have no memories of him, she knew that he had moved in the realms of God in such a way that he was powerfully used by God. There are those who say that, that uh, my father, Jack Schuler, uh, saved, had through his ministry saved as many as a million people for Jesus during his brief time as an evangelist, the decade of evangelism that he had before he died. I can't even fathom that. He held these great meetings. He had the largest meetings that that Ireland has ever known. He held in, in the history of Ireland up to that point. And my mom wanted me to be in that realm. She wanted me to know what that was like. She wanted me to rub shoulders with people who thought biblically and hungered after God and prayed prayers that shook nations. And she knew that had been a part of what she had experienced in life. My mom was raised at Angelus Temple, Amy Simple McPherson. She was the personal assistant to Catherine Kuhlman. She worked for Oral Roberts. She had more the charismatic side. 
My dad, again, very close with Billy Graham, moving and shaking at the same time as, as Dr. Graham. And so I wrote to Cliff Barrows, who was my dad's song leader before he was Mr. Graham's song leader, and Cliff Barrows opened up that opportunity to be there at the uh, crusade. And, and in being there, I really experienced a sense of what ministry was really like. And I remember also going to Belfast, Northern Ireland, and going at a perfect time when that Windsor Stadium that held 60,000 people that was filled for dad's final meeting. Uh, there, uh, I remember that I was there at the perfect time because they were just tearing it down. Half of it had been torn down. The other half was still there. And it was the half that my father would have stood at and preached. And I picked up a stone that I have in my office to this day, remembering where my dad preached and feeling a sense of my dad's presence in my life. She wanted me to stay in the land of my father long enough to capture a sense of doing more than just living to meet your bills. But to know the calling that was upon my life. And that was extremely important to her. Was there dysfunction in this family of Jacob and Joseph and the brothers that we read about? Absolutely. And I believe that with all of our families, there's something that's there that we'd rather not talk about. It's not the first thing we share when we tell about our family. And for some of us, it brings maybe shame or or guilt or just hurt or a sense of emptiness. Family secrets. They used to call them skeletons in the closet. And those are the things that we don't always talk about. Listen, Jesus had a dysfunctional family. Rahab, Tamar, you want to talk about prostitution? These are in the very line that would bring forth the Messiah. God delights in stepping right in to the dirt of our lives until he redeems what we thought would keep us from effectiveness or ever being used by the kingdom of God. I knew in my family that I was a product of dad's second family, his second marriage. He had been divorced, they had divorced, and there was a remarriage. And so to have my brother Jack, who's from the first family, my dad's firstborn, with me last night meant the world to me, and I saw how God had worked with something that the enemy tried to say, it's over now. I stopped that, that heritage in its tracks, and the reality is to see God come in and just be so wonderful to me as to give me my brother to affirm me last night and to be proud of me. I felt like my dad was sitting next to me. I don't know what it is in your family, but I can tell you what. I had to stop with this first point this morning and not move too much far, farther than it because I believe the Holy Spirit is just moving in regard to healing those things in our families and healing our hearts in regard to identity. I can tell you something. There is... Such a love between this father and son, Jacob and Joseph. It's a family story, and it's a love story between a father and a son. Jacob loved his son so much. He made a beautiful, ornate robe for him. So I've entitled my message, The Coats of Joseph, because there are key moments in which Joseph will wear a coat that symbolizes an era or a a moment in life that will shape him to be the one so greatly used by God to save a people in his generation. But we read about how it was something where his father loved him more than the other brothers. That was the unique dysfunction, perhaps, in that family. Each of us can have different dysfunctional backgrounds, but that was the unique dysfunction there. Because when you look at it, That caused the strife, and that caused the sense of feeling that Joseph was favored, and so the other brothers hated him. That It wasn't wise, perhaps, to do what Jacob did in that way, but he favored, he just loved what he saw in Joseph. And he didn't have all the details and all the particulars, but he had a sense and inkling that God was going to use him in a great way. I could tell Jacob this if I could go back in time. God's going to use every one of your sons in a great way, not just Joseph. 
Here we have the father giving this beautiful, we, we used to talk about it when we were kids in Sunday school, the coat of many colors. And he gives that to his son because he so loves him and so favors him. And we see also the love in return. Because Joseph will be the one to be with his father when he dies. He will be there when he draws his last breath. He will be there as a moment of legacy. He will not let his father die without understanding that somebody gets the legacy of this thing. And somebody understands the moment of this thing. And somebody recognizes the life of this individual, this father, who set certain things in motion and it wouldn't have been the way that it was without him. I sometimes think to myself, what was it that Jacob invested in Joseph? What, what was it that he gave to him out of his own life? Because dads, dads, were to invest in our children those things that God has taught us so that they're carried into the next generation. And I think of Jacob having been a person who knew deceit in his life, but he's also had a father-in-law that sought to deceive him. And in some way, for him to get past all that, he had to forgive. He had to. And that forgiveness maybe was planted in his son Joseph. Because Joseph is an archetype of Jesus. And that means Joseph shows us Jesus before Jesus is born in Bethlehem. There's something about the life of Joseph. And I'll tell you what it is. It has so much to do with how he forgave. Joseph forgave par excellence. Oh, he knew how to forgive. And here we have this moment in which we see the investment of the father and all of this that will show that you've got a family here where God's on the move, even in the midst of dysfunction. And even with the things out of your family, God's on the move. Listen, please hear it. I'm not just saying that because in some way it sounds like a good current day tag. I'm telling you from the heart of God, he is on the move in your family. He's going to use you. And we've got a responsibility and an assignment, and I believe we're going to carry forth that assignment in all ways with excellence. Jacob made an ornate robe for Joseph. This is one of three robes that I'm going to talk about, one of three coats over the course of today and next uh, Sunday as well. This robe represents the identity of Joseph. It's his identity. And I can say that when we talk about a beautifully ornate robe, what we're really talking about there, if you go back in time, that would have meant a robe similar to what royalty would wear. So imagine for a moment Joseph walking in dusty fields and, and, and watching over his brothers and the work that they do, and he shows up as he does all this in his royal robes. How would you feel if you were a sibling? And that sense of his father seeing something in him without knowing all the details yet is that his father did not dress him, meaning Joseph. His father did not dress Joseph as to Joseph's environment at the time. And Jacob did not dress his son Joseph as to Joseph's circumstances. They're out in the heat of the day and the, and working in the fields and all of that. That's not how he dressed him. Joseph's father dressed Joseph as to his future. And as to his calling. And it was not the moment that Joseph became the one that led the land of Egypt and was given that position by the Pharaoh and had that great, awesome position in which people would say, make way, make way, Joseph is coming. People would make way for him. His brothers would bow. Others would bow. It was a great position of great authority. 
and power. But I can tell you, the anointing that was upon him didn't hit him at that moment. It hit him in the fields. His father dressed him as to the calling on his life. I don't know what circumstances you face right now. I don't know what you're feeling about where you work or this season of life, the people that you have as your friends, the things you do through the course of the week on Monday through Friday and then into the weekend. But I can tell you the anointing that is upon you for the unique calling on your life that only you can do is upon you right now. And other people may not even recognize it, even your own family. But there was a father that did, and he dressed him with a richly ornamented robe to say, son, there's something ahead. I don't know the details, but there's something ahead. And there, being dressed like that, he goes right back into the fields with his nice robe to check on his brothers. And it reminds me of David, because King David was anointed by Samuel, the prophet, And after he was anointed, where did he go? Right back into the fields. But he was already anointed king. He doesn't go to sit on the throne. He doesn't go to look at military plans to get chariots together and command men in war. He doesn't do those things. He goes right back in the fields. Right back in the fields. And that anointing upon you, you go right back into what you were in last week. This next week you're going right back into it. But you'll have a recognition of the anointing on your life. And upon the calling that God has upon your life. And it's powerful. And folks, it's real. And I want you to recognize it. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said these words. It's one of my favorite quotes. I've enjoyed this for years and years. Listen to it. He said, if it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures, like Shakespeare wrote poetry, Like Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. You see, if we are always waiting for the day in which we will have all the money and the titles and the position and people applaud and the lights will be on and, and uh, the bright lights and everybody will know. Listen, that's not the moment where destiny happens. It happens in moments of the heart. It happens in moments when nobody would stop to pause and place their eyes on you and say you're the one that will make the difference in the family, in the community, in the world. Now is the time to walk in your anointing. Now is the time to recognize that God has his favor upon you. Please hear me. Don't settle for less. I've seen people who have gone all the way through life. They get into their elderly years. They're still fighting things in regard to things from the past. Be set free in the name of Jesus, including all those things that are family things. Walk in your freedom. You've got an anointed testimony. God's carrying you forward. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Billy Graham wrote me a letter when I was a boy. He knew the calling of God on my life, and he said, Bill, I want to give you some advice. Read your Bible and pray daily and try to tell your friends and neighbors about Jesus. And in the years to come, we'll give you advice that can help you in your career. Start here. Sometimes we think those things are so basic, maybe just so small, but it all begins there. Joseph, we know, will be placed in a pit. We know that he'll be sold into slavery. But in Genesis, the 37th chapter, in the 31st and the 32nd verses, the Bible says uh, these words. Then they got Joseph's robe, meaning the brothers of Joseph. They got it. They slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, we have found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. That robe will be used as an identifier. And his father, in looking at it, knew that was an identity connect between he and his son. And he knew that was his son's coat. And he saw the blood all over it and was was convinced that his son had been torn apart by wild animals. And now he had lost the one that he cherished so much in whom he saw such great promise. It was a ruse. But at that moment, his father felt he had lost his love. 